Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry to disrupt your, your conversation. Uh, I know we're all having such a great discussion outside as well, but uh, we, should probably get, we should probably get started. Bienvenue à l'Ambassade du Canada. Welcome to the Embassy of Canada. My name is Jason Latour. I'm the Senior Trade Commissioner here at the Embassy. Um, I, you know, we're delighted today to have organized for you a very cool, crisp uh, Canadian fall morning. And uh, so we hope you enjoyed that on the walk to, to the Embassy today. Um, we're incredibly delighted to be hosting today's event today with the Quebec uh, government, represented here today by uh, Paul and Charles and Kirsten. Where's Kirsten? Oh, there she is at the back. Great. And, uh, and also with leaders in energy, represented by a few people, uh, including Janine uh, Fennell, who's here, and John as well. John is where? Maybe he's having a last cup of coffee outside. Um, and just to everyone that is here uh, today who've taken the time to join us, we really appreciate your participation and uh, look forward to your uh, engagement in, in the discussion. The first thing I need to do, uh, and it's thanks to Quebec's uh, kind generosity, is that uh, they have de dedicated this, uh, uh, this food basket uh, from Quebec. And if you know the province of Quebec, they have really some of the best food items in Canada including, of course, maple syrup. So there is a bottle of maple syrup in there, but there's other things too, including some of Quebec's uh, great uh, beer and other food items. But to win this, you need to deposit your cards into our Kleenex box. <laughs> and uh, so in line with the theme of today's circular economy, we are reusing this Kleenex box. And I, I should say that um, I, I frankly think uh, Quebec is just testing us and will be testing the winner to see whether or not the winner of this food basket can really achieve uh, zero food waste. So um, make sure that uh, you're paying close attention to today's remarks. So we have two uh, really interesting uh, panels today bringing together experts from both the private and public sectors. Uh, the panels will include, of course, two uh, innovative uh, Canadian companies, Enerchem, which built the world's first waste to biofuel certified facility, and SolyuCycle, which builds a leading zero waste solution for commercial kitchens. Uh, the circular economy is an important topic for all of us, and it's really about sustainability and uh, good environmental stewardship. And that's why we're really delighted to be hosting the event today at the Canadian Embassy. Canada, as many of you uh, are probably aware, is really committed to a clean, uh, innovative economy that reduces emissions and protects our environment. Um, and and um, I don't know if many of you have been listening to the news uh, recently, but it's come up in the news again that uh, the Canadian federal government is also uh, committed to a pan-Canadian carbon tax, um, which will certainly contribute to a clean growth economy uh, necessary for our collective health and well-being in Canada and our security, not only for this generation, but for many generations to come. And across North America, organizations and governments, such as the ones that are represented on the panel today, are on the leading edge of, you know, promoting, encouraging, supporting, driving, creating some of these new clean and renewable technologies and promoting the circular economy. So we see these partners who are on the panel today really as, 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 as partners for Canada committed to advancing a climate resilient and uh, environmentally sustainable economy. So we hope you'll find discussions today insightful and we also hope that you will think when you think of potential partners in the circular economy or in clean energy, renewable energy, or in building a sustainable economy that you think of Canada. And with that, it is my pleasure now to introduce to you Janine Fennell, the Executive Director from Leaders in Energy. Janine. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Wow, good morning, and thank you for such a beautiful day outside. It's gorgeous. Welcome to our event on transforming waste into energy to advance a circular economy, and it is a distinct pleasure to be partnering with the Quebec Government Office and Embassy of Canada. And I want to make a special shout out to Charles. I know he's very shy. He's right here in the front row. And his team, including Adina Mansour, who's taking a photo of me right now. Thank you very much. And uh, just want to thank you for arranging this event. Um, Charles is a Leaders in Energy member who's the lead energy attache at the Quebec office and recently spoke at our Circular Economy Working Group in August, all about the cool work going on in uh, Quebec on a circular economy. Me. And then it was kind of his brainchild. It's like, hey, Janine, you want to do a circular economy event? It's like, fantastic. That'll make it this fourth annual event for leaders in energy to be working on a circular economy. I'm just so proud and gratified to see all of you who are here today. And we really reached out to invite everyone who had attended all of our circular economy events in the past, as well as our circular economy working group. So it's just wonderful to see people that are uh, involved in this area. And uh, many thanks for joining us here today. Um, I just want to say, when we started working in this area, the circular economy was a bit of a niche topic. It's like, huh, circular economy, what is that? I was at an energy economics conference and made an announcement about an event coming up. And I'd say, I asked for a show of hands of who knew about the circular economy. It was like maybe 10 to 15 percent. I'm so glad to say that is really changing. A Leaders in Energy member of mine just told me about Circular Charlotte down in North Carolina, where they've developed a whole plan on zero waste and a circular economy. I was just talking with one of my leaders and energy members here about Montgomery County and how one Montgomery Green has been mapping and doing quite a lot in the circular economy. And we're working on that as well. So if you're interested in being involved in a working group, we're looking to see how to implement the circular economy here in the Washington, D.C. area. And we've been working for about a year. There was just a meeting last night. I'm sorry to say I wasn't able to get to that because I was preparing to be on the panel here. So just really looking forward to having um, our discussion. And uh, I guess just one last thing, and that is, I think the potential is really great for the circular economy. I don't know if you're familiar with this new report that came out from the Global Commission on Economy and Climate, but it talks about a $26 trillion economic opportunity by 2030 for the new climate economy. They talk about clean energy, clean tech, smart cities, and guess what? They talk about the circular economy. Woohoo! I'm just really happy to see that really getting into the mainstream. And thanks to our friends here at Canada for um, helping to uh, progress that. So um, as Jason said, we'll have two panels, and we're going to launch into that uh, right now. I see Charles giving me that look and winking. OK. Uh, panel one, just a reminder, we'll focus on transforming waste into energy to advance the circular economy. And panel two, I'm delighted to say that yours truly will be moderating that on food waste and can commercial kitchens achieve zero food waste. So without any further ado, I am going to introduce Bob Lazaro, who is the panel moderator for panel one. Bob is the executive director of the Northern Virginia Regional Commission. He's also the former mayor of Purcellville in Virginia. So we are so distinguished and happy to have you here. Uh, Bob is a real champion of alternative energy in a circular economy. And I first met Bob when um, I attended, how many breakfasts have I been at your place? It's fantastic. He convenes all these officials in Northern Virginia uh, from the government and private sector in sustainability topics. And I just want to say, Bob really walks the talk when it comes to renewable energy and and sustainable lifestyles. He has a four kilowatt solar array on his house in Percival and drives. I didn't know you had two electric cars. I knew you had one. Um, and then a three, what? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, but I learned a fun fact uh, from a colleague of his that Bob is passionate about a German Swabian form of dinner feast called a Bursen Wurschatz, which re uh, specializes in regional food and wine. So I like the food touch, since that's going to be the theme of the panel that I'm moderating today. So please join me in welcoming Bob Lazaro. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you. And I, I'd just like to echo Janine's comments and, and thank the, uh, our friends in Canada and Quebec and, and leaders in energy for having us here this morning on, on a very important topic. Um, as you heard, I'm a recovering politician, uh, having served as mayor of the town of Percival 
home to some of the finest wineries and a great distillery, so come on out. <laughs> still, still doing commercials for my home community. Um, you know, when we talk about circular economy, we're going to talk about circular careers for a minute. Uh, when I first started in local government 38 years ago, um, landfills and waste energy plants was the hot topic, and we started the first community-wide recycling program in the town of North Hempstead on Long Island in New York, and uh, my boss lost his election due to the effort of trying to site a waste energy plant in our community because the state had put in place a law that banned all municipal uh, solid waste landfilling on Long Island uh, to protect the, um, the water supply. With that, I would like to ask our, our panelists uh, to come on up. And we have with us today Dave McConnell, who's Vice President at Enerchem. Uh, we have Hans Christensen, who's Director of Operations at the Fairfax, for, uh, Director of Operations at Fairfax County. We have Chris Piott, who's Director of Resource Recovery at DC Water and Sewer Authority. And Adam Ortiz, who's the Director for the Department of Environment at the Prince George's County. So welcome, gentlemen. Glad you could be here this morning. And I'm going to ask each of you to pick up your microphones because we're going to give each of you uh, two minutes to uh, introduce yourselves and a little bit about the work that you're doing. So David, we will start with you. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, <clears throat> talk a little bit about Enerchem uh, to you all in, in regards to zero economy. I've, uh, I've got a long history in, in the garbage business, so I, I was in the garbage business for over 30 years, and uh, this is kind of a move in, in looking at all alternatives. But one of the things I wanted to do is, in, instead of boring you with, with my discussion, is we actually have a video that I would just like to uh, run through to kind of give you the perspective of what we see the opportunities exist out there. And just one comment in regards to that is we see ourselves as just one part of the circular economy. There's many, many pieces to the puzzle that really have to be put together. Uh, and that's where when we look at all of the different technologies that exist out there, we see where we can, we can fit in in post-recycling, post-composting operations. Good morning. Is that working? Yes? Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Hans Christensen. I am the Solid Waste uh, Director um, of Operations at Fairfax County. I've uh, been there a fairly short time, four to five years. Um, prior to that, uh, 30 years or so in the, in the private industry, all in uh, the waste industry. Um, I've got a, a, a background as well in law and finance and, and environmental science. Um, <clears throat> Those, those sometimes mix and sometimes don't. Um, having, having arrived at, uh, at Fairfax County in the, in, the, in the last few years has been a, a bit of an eye-opener for me, kind of making that switch from the 
private side to the public side, but um, um, for a lot of reasons, it's been uh, encouraging and, and um, for different reasons, very challenging. This slide here just gives you just a couple of, you know, things that give you a little bit of flair for the, the, the things that, that we face in, in Fairfax County. If you're not familiar, it's, uh, it's a county of about 400 square miles, over a million people. Um, there are elements of both, you know, urban, suburban, and rural settings in the county. So it, it, it creates its own challenges from, from Tyson's Corner out to the, the you know, the, the western edge near Prince William County. Um, all, all different challenges that we have to um, face every day. The, the focus that, that we have, that we continue to have and will have, is on sustainability. So I, I think that plays well and, and is uh, um, consistent with the circular economy. We, uh, we focus with, on three phases of that, though, both uh, the environmental piece, the financial piece, and the social piece. So um, you, can, you can see the, um, just a couple of the, with the photos, a couple of the projects that we've looked at. The one is, is Meadows, so at our I-95 landfill complex, which we hope to change the name from landfill to sustainability park or something. But we're, we're putting up some, some native meadows there. We've, we've partnered with GMU on pollinators, so we've, we've set out beehives. Um, we've, we've, um, we've constructed and, and are processing glass so that we can um, provide construction material to our, our sister agencies, stormwater, wastewater, when they're laying pipe. Um, there is um, many, many acres now that are under um, planting for hay, so you can see a bale of hay up there. We don't go buy it anymore, we grow it ourselves. We've, we hire some folks that can handle all that. So. Um, I, I think we're on the right track, but at the same time, there's many challenges. We have three facilities. One's a collection operation that, that uh, collects about 10% of the county. There is uh, the landfill, where we just landfill ash from a uh, waste energy facility, which is where most of our volume goes. It's a Covanta facility, co-located on our I-95 landfill. And then we have the I-66 transfer station, which is a kind of bring it all in over a million tons a year of material. So um, we're, we're constrained by space, we're constrained by cost, um, and all of those things kind of come into play. Our, our focus now moving forward with this sustainability initiative is um, not just one solution, but a whole host of solutions that'll, that'll help reach that, that goal of sustainability. And, in employing the circular economy. Thank you. Adam? Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm uh, the director of Prince George's County Department of the Environment. And for those of you who aren't familiar, Prince George's is the big county to the east of here, um, about five miles. Um, similar to Fairfax, we're urban, suburban, and rural. Uh, we have a, about a million residents. And uh, we'd love to have you for lunch today, if you want to come by. So we're about five miles away. I'm also mindful of the neighbor up the street. I just want to say that Prince George's County is a cherished ally of Canada. And uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a pleasure to be having a positive dialogue with you on behalf of the people of Prince George's County. <laughs> so. <laughs> Don't get into politics. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, so, uh, so I'll just uh, uh, introduce a little bit briefly. And also, I just want to acknowledge a fellow mayor. I'm, I'm also uh, a recovering politician. I was mayor of a small town of Edmonston, which is up Rhode Island Avenue from here in, uh, in, in Maryland, about a couple miles. Um, a lot of sustainable initiatives that we launched there, and not least of which uh, is an organic farm called Eco City Farms, uh, which is a circular farm, uh, provides workforce training, uh, uh, produce and, and vegetables for local restaurants, um, and also composting, circular. And, and we have some representatives from Eco City Farms today, if you just raise your hand briefly, in the great town of Edmonston. <laughs> So, um, so uh, briefly about um, Prince George's, um, where uh, we've taken um, very seriously um, our responsibility to the environment, and uh, so much that we've rebranded a lot of our department. We created a dedicated department of the environment, and we renamed our solid waste division uh, the resource recovery division. 
Um, in the last uh, eight years under the Baker administration, we put a lot of effort um, into um, waste diversion. Um, we have our own recycling facility, our own landfill, and our own organics composting facility in Upper Marlboro. Um, through a variety of very progressive laws and source reduction, we've been able to get our diversion rate up to 65 percent, which for three years in a row is the, large, is the, the greatest in uh, the state of Maryland. Uh, so we're very, very proud of that. And uh, part of the reason we've been able to achieve that is, um, is by growing a very successful uh, food scrap organics composting operation. So uh, behind me, you see a little bit of a pretty awkward rectangular circle. But um, <laughs> we've, uh, in, in our facility, um, we've uh, expanded from a, a pilot program six years ago of about 4,000 tons a year to uh, an expansion that we just completed more than 60,000 tons a year of uh, processing food scraps from throughout the region. Uh, we collect um, that material from a variety of institutions. In the upper left here are students at the University of Maryland, uh, the University of Maryland in the cafeteria, and, um, uh, and in the food service uh, division, they capture food scraps. Um, but we've expanded to um, more than 100 partners throughout the region, including Smithsonian, um, virtually every university here. And I was just told um, before from Janine that actually this embassy also sends its food scraps to our facility. Um, so we're very pleased about this um, operation. Um, food scraps uh, comprise about 32% uh, of what's sent to our landfill. So it's a, tr it's a tremendous waste. Um, <clears throat> but we take the material, we compost it. I'll talk in more detail about it. And we create a product called Leaf Grow Gold. And Leaf Grow, as some of you are familiar, uh, is created by Prince George's in Montgomery County and sold as a soil, an organic soil amendment uh, at Lowe's and Home Depot. Uh, and other facilities throughout the region. And it's our circular way of putting that material back into the soil. And um, on the upper right um, is part of the circle, which is Terp Farm. So it's uh, quite literally a circle that we're collecting material from the University of Maryland. Um, it goes through the processing um, at our facility, and then it ends up back in the soil, including at Terp Farm, which is the University of Maryland Educational Farm in Upper Marlboro. Um, and the architect of the Capitol, which also uses our material. But more to come, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, thanks. My name is Chris Piat. I am the uh, Director of Resource Recovery. We also use the term resource recovery at DC Water. Uh, I work at a gigantic wastewater treatment plant, Blue Plains. Uh, before I get to me, I want to talk about how the great product that Adam does produce there, the uh, Leaf Grow Gold and Leaf Grow. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys sell out every year, right? which to me means there's room to expand this market. There's, there's great demand for the, for, the, for the compost, which means that there's uh, a need for more feedstocks. Um, I use the term wastewater, and I hate that term. <laughs> uh, much like Hans, you know, we're trying to rebrand what we do. And we don't even refer to ourselves as a, a uh, wastewater treatment plant anymore, but rather as a resource recovery facility recovering water, the world's most precious commodity, but also carbon, nutrients, and energy. A lot of times people lump carbon and energy together. We try not to do that because I don't think it's terribly sustainable to turn all of that carbon into energy. We need to return some of that carbon back to the land from which it came. So we have, I think, the best of both worlds. We built digesters. Uh, Wheels of Progress turned slowly. It's been taking a very long time. But about three years ago, we, we built uh, digesters preceded by thermal hydrolysis, upper left-hand corner there. And we are uh, producing 500 tons a day, wet tons a day, of beautiful, and I really mean beautiful, digestate that comes out of the bottom of, of, the, of the digesters. That's the photo there of our product going to a community garden. Uh, that's our Bloom product. We've branded it as Bloom. Uh, very proud of that. We're selling some of it. Some of it we still have to pay somebody to take away. But it all goes to farms. None of it goes to landfills. And we have a plan to, to market all of that material. And I, I'm I'm always happy to hear that you guys are selling out because that means that there's room in the market. <laughs> uh, I know that this isn't part of the circular economy here, but what we're trying to do also is take advantage of our, uh, our assets. The upper right-hand corner there is our site. It's 157 acres. We have plans to put in 14 and a half megawatts of solar panels on there. Uh, phase one is underway. It's four and a half megawatts. 
Um, we can sell the renewable energy credits, uh, which is great. Um, we even are, have two projects where we're drawing heat out of the sewers and capturing that so that we can heat buildings with them. And we make honey. We have bees at the plant. And our risk management people were a little bit <laughs> touchy on this. Like, what, do you really want to have bees? But, but we sold it on the idea that uh, we want to ingratiate ourselves to the urban ag community so that they use our product. You know, that we understand the plight that they have in pollination. And we have this beautiful site, 157 acres right next to the river. So we have four giant hives of, be uh, of bees, and we make honey. We don't sell it, but we give it away. We give it away to officials, um, and it's, it's great. And uh, the line up on top, I really, that's sort of our mantra, no such thing as waste, only wasted resources. And I really think that that should be the mantra of the circular economy movement, because nothing is waste. It's, it's all just wasted resources. So thanks for having me. Great. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I think what you've heard is um, a lot of great innovative work going on in um, both sides of the river and, and in the city. Um, but you know, technology is always changing and what folks thought couldn't be is now and had a long conversation about blockchain the other day and how that can impact on, on, uh, on energy use and decarbonization. But I mean, Dave, if, if, if I could start with you, I mean, how do you see technology changing and, and reducing the need to go to landfills and or to waste recovery facilities? Well, I think waste recovery facilities are, are, are a key part of the overall uh, management of, of the waste streams. I see that new technologies are being developed every day uh, and coming online and going from pilot operations to commercial operations, I mean, it's been a very, very slow, uh, it's not a 100-yard dash, it's a marathon. And I mean, if you look at Enercam, it took us, eight, it took us over 15 years to produce our first commercial uh, <clears throat> product uh, versus, you know, trying to go from pilot to that. So I think you're going to see more and more growth of all of these, you know, new companies that are coming out. And one of the things that, that I see is key and was interesting when I was talking to Hans is, you know, people are looking at a sustainable park these days versus having all of the different pieces of the puzzle to where everybody feeds off of the resources that are generated out there. And you see this not as a, a waste stream, I agree 100%. These are really resources that, you know, we're currently, you know, putting into landfills. Yes, we are capturing gas off of that and producing electricity, which is beneficial. But long term, I see landfills, you know, really <clears throat> exiting and us taking advantage of the products that are being generated and reusing and putting those back into, into the, the communities. Thank you. Hans, you in, in Fairfax County, biggest county in Virginia, one of the largest in, in the country in terms of population. I mean, you, Covanta had a little bit of an issue with a fire in their plant. It's been repaired. Um, I mean, what do you see as the future of uh, waste to energy and opportunities perhaps to even capture some of that heat coming out of the top for other uses uh, in the community? I think those opportunities are, are kind of endless. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, I think it's, a, it's also a, um, a, a bit of a shotgun approach in the sense that um, the, the materials will, will kind of be divided up. So we'll have, we'll have options and opportunities, and, and we have recently looked at this, um, actually put out an RFEI, a Request for Expressions of Interest, on, on different technologies and different processes and procedures for handling material in the future. So we're not just a waste energy first um, um, disposer, and then our backup is landfills. We want to look at the whole array of opportunities that we can use and we can employ to to begin to to reuse material, to 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 recycle material, to to um, repurpose material. We've we've got a number of those projects that are that are ongoing. Um, we, we recently just got nominated for um, an award for a, a, a program that we use for our, our used paint at our HHW facility. We, um, we sell that back to Habitat for Humanity and then they put it in their restores and it's one of their top selling products. So it's, it's, it's an effort that's, that's multifaceted and 
And I think that, um, you know, we, 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 we kind of have to come to grips with that because it's, this, is not a, um, this is not a one solution issue. Thank you. Adam, you guys are doing great work, but I mean, uh, as a former elected official yourself, some of these things cost money and that also, then that requires political will. I mean, how long did it take the evolution in Prince George's County to get to the point where you, where you are today? That's a great, great question. Um, it's uh, always a work in progress. Um, you know, one of the things that helps is the business case. So the, um, you know, especially with the, the, the recycling markets um, so distressed um, because of uh, uh, China's strictness about taking our material, uh, we have to think of innovative ways to, to recover value from the waste stream. So we did a, 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 an audit of what's going to the landfill a couple years ago, and uh, what it told us was that um, um, about more than 80% of that material has value and can be used again. Stuff that we put into the landfill costs the taxpayers, even though people tip at the landfill, um, and we have other revenue streams, still costs about $52 a ton to process. And then we have a responsibility to take care of that material for 30 years or more uh, uh, under state and federal law. When we have recycled material, uh, depending on the commodity, we could you know, lose some money, maybe 10, 10 20, or $30 a, a ton, uh, which is still less than landfilling, or make as much as um, $1,000 or $1,500 a ton through aluminum, for example. The compost product that we make uh, is netting us about $10 a ton. So that's just a, a business case. Uh, in terms of assets, so we have a landfill. Uh, other folks have a, a waste to energy facilities. So our landfill has an expiration date. Um, we've invested literally billions in it um, since 1968. So that's an asset that we don't want to exhaust right away. So we want to make sure that we create as much space as possible. So we have the business case, but we can't do anything in the public sector, as you know, Mayor, um, without um, public buy-in. Um, so the little micro decisions that residents make every day about, you know, what, what they put their waste in a recycling can or someplace else, or they're choosing sustainable products, you know, all of that, you know, is part of you know, a change in mentality that we need to, to be able to be more efficient. But what we find is people want to do the right thing. People are concerned um, about uh, the welfare of uh, their neighborhood, their county, their state, and want to participate, and it's incumbent on us as leaders to make that case. Thank you. Chris, same question to you. The Blue Plains was a significant investment by the city. Yeah, it was, and it's, uh, we're our own autonomous authority, so we're in charge of our own budget, and, um, I was extremely proud of our board for making the investment to build the digesters. Uh, it was a discretionary project. We didn't have to do it. It was $470 million, and usually that sum of, fun of, that sum of money is uh, reserved for f projects that are forced upon us by a consent decree or something <laughs> that have no payback period. But we were able to make the business case based on the energy that we were going to produce, the reduction of biosolids, hauling cost, um, and a few other different things that showed that it was about a 15 year payback period, which is pretty good for the digesters. The bulk of the investment was the digesters, which have about a 75 year lifespan. But really it took some intestinal fortitude for them to do that and to trust the numbers. Um, what I like about the projects that I described on my slide there is, you know, I, I have this job because I want to do my little part to help save the planet and the first half of my career I used to lead with that. Like, let's do this, it's the right thing. And everybody liked it, but I found that the executives get much more excited when I can show it's gonna save us money or it's gonna generate revenue. <laughs> and every one of those projects does that. It's, it's really great. I mean, if you dig into the numbers, every one of those have a very short payback period. So I now lead with that. Saving or making money, that, that's a home run anytime yeah. the manager would come up to the town council with, with a suggestion. You know, uh, there was a brief mention of the issue of, of China and, I guess, Operation Sword, and they're not taking a lot of our um, recycled materials. Um, how, much is, how much is that a, a problem that we've caused ourselves with single-stream recycling in our communities? Everything goes in the can, and there's no discretion or thought given to anything anymore in terms of what gets thrown in. 
I know, uh, let, me, let me start with you, Adam. Uh, I'm not sure if it's quite a problem where you are, Chris. Thank you, that's, it's a great, a great question. Um, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar, there's been a debate for decades about whether single stream is better than dual stream or separating the streams. And the argument for single stream is that more people put more stuff in and then the processors will kind of pick it apart and divide it and we get more stuff. The downside is that it gets dirty and messy and some of it can't be used, so we lose some value. And I think in general, um, it's kind of a wash, the argument has been, because you get some benefits in some ways with one, you get some benefits with others. There's downsides to you know one and, and the other. Um, part of the reason China has not been uh, buying our stuff is because it's so dirty, it's so contaminated. Um, so that's an argument for single stream and source reduction. Um, but and I'll also say that, quite frankly, I don't think that we've upped our game enough um, as um, jurisdictions on making sure that you know, we are doing a better job recycling, that we are educating our residents. By and large, uh, recycling rates around the county, based on what I, uh, uh, country, based on what I've seen, have been pretty flat for, uh, for more than a decade. So I think it is time that you know, we really need to invest um, more discussion uh, more education and more resources into telling people this is an everyday decision that multiplied over millions of people or tens of millions of people is a major economic, um, a, a global economic impact and, and is really, so I think we need to do that. Technology has a piece too. You know, there's new technologies, new sorting technologies that can divide plastics better by color, um, that can take care of glass uh, issue and uh, we need to be more creative with paper. So I think, you know, we, we've been comfortable with, oh, well, we're doing this, we're making some money and, you know, we're the government, so we just keep doing what we do and, you know, people don't pay that much attention to the environment anyway. But, you know, we have to sort of break out of that and be like, you know, we need, we need a new rush of innovation to, to really get to the next level and create a product that people want to buy. Hans, same question. Yeah, I think Adam's right. Um, a year ago, we, we got a check for our recyclable material that, that the county picks up. And you know, what, how do you argue with that, right? We got a check. Um, and then it started going south. And it's, um, and it's now pretty much in terms of cost per ton on par with the disposal costs that we have at the, the waste energy plant. So we're, we're, I mean, from a financial perspective, we're not seeing any benefit there. And it's been probably a, anywhere from 600 to $750,000 annual swing for us. So it's, it's been significant, it's been sizable. Um, but I also agree that, you know, because of that, we, we have kind of lagged behind in the outreach and in the education, and it's, and it's one of the things that, that we've kind of looked at and said, all right, we, we need to up our game. We need to have a better program. We need, to, we need to look at how we're doing that and what makes sense. The other piece of that for us has been to reach out to some of the people that we're dealing with and some of the other partners. Um, not the least of which is the, you know, the company that's processing our material. What can we do to help? Um, what do you need? Is there, is there something that we can do to make this process a little cleaner, easier, and add value? And, and we've, we've looked at kind of reaching out to, um, to different parts of the, the, the community, at least the business community, um, at this point, to, to find out can we do that? I mean, we've, we've got this glass processing machine where do we, and, and we've started that. We go to wineries and breweries and, you know, there's a lot of glass there and, and we can take all that material. Um, we've, we've, we've talked with the grocery stores and, you know, how do we, how do we increase that volume of the, the, the plastic film and the bags back to the grocery store as opposed to putting it in the single stream and, and, have the mess that it creates with, um, you know, clogging up all of the, the, the machinery. So there's, there's a number of things um, that, that I think we need to do again. I'm back to the, the multifaceted approach. And uh, um, I mean, I think we also need to kind of weather the storm. I know there's some communities that, you know, that cost um, issue is, is, is overwhelming and they're not able to absorb it. 
Um, we, we feel like we have to, we need to get through this. Um, it's something that, that we need to factor in and, and maybe it won't come back to where it was right away, but um, there's a lot more that we can do to, to, to solve that problem and make it better. David? Yeah, I, just, I just want to comment on that because I, th I find it interesting is, uh, so as you look at a lot of the uh, reductions in being able to ship material to China, one of the things that we're seeing is the producers of the plastics out there, they are finally coming to a realization that there is a major problem out there and how can we address it. So they are putting together programs, the, you know, the, the, the DAOs, the uh, uh, Borealis of the world, the major producers, what can we do? And taking it on as a responsibility and really looking at it from a circular economy standpoint. Because as you look at, you know, today's the traditional recycling, a lot of that material, once you recycle it so many times, it really loses its value. They're looking at taking this material putting it back as the molecules and taking those molecules and actually reproducing new plastics from these waste plastics. So we're definitely seeing people stepping up to the game and it's really being brought on by the restrictions that you know, China has placed on the waste that can go there. Chris, how, I mean, how do you see innovation changing you know, the wastewater industry and, and what's, what's on the horizon for you all in, in terms of your facilities and, and trends, et cetera, and, and how is that going to impact what you're doing? Yeah, this isn't terrib terribly innovative, but uh, we're very interested in co-digestion. We have these new beautiful digesters. Uh, the operators aren't quite ready to start squirting food into them yet because we've got some unexplained foaming issues that we have to solve, but uh, that's going to get solved, and we have capacity, and every city in the nation as a wastewater treatment plant, and many of them have digesters, and we overbuild, you know, in anticipation of, of growth in the city. So a lot of the digesters have have uh, excess capacity. So then it, we have to again convince our board that uh, it's it's uh, we have a good business case for it. Um, they're not going to. Um, if it were me, I would just use the field of dreams theory that you know if you build it, they will come. Uh, but that's not good enough for our board. So we have to establish relationships with businesses and restaurants. And I think that you know, rather than a stick approach of forcing people to do it, I'd, I'd rather do something that incentivizes both. You know, try and figure out a way to um, to, to do something that's mutually beneficial. Of this idea, we have this idea that maybe we set up a program with local restaurants so that we could certify them as a I don't know a Blue Drop certified restaurant that has a food waste recycling program and then it comes and it gets ground up and slurried into something that eventually ends up in our digesters and we can make more green energy out of it and they get something they can put in their window and they we can promote them on our website so it's, it's not high tech but it's just nice it's sort of a mutually beneficial approach that, that's that's interesting you see that some some of the businesses have have certain types of certifications we have about three minutes more for Q&A, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. So I always like to ask this question. Benevolent leader for the day, if there was one thing that you could do um, in your job, in your industry, um, to make a positive difference, what would that be? David? Interesting question. Uh, I, I think to really make the, the, the positive uh, point in, in our industry is to really develop a much stronger educational program as to people on how they are managing their waste streams. You know, I've been in, as I mentioned, I've been in garbage business for over 30 years and most people just <clears throat> put the garbage at the end of the driveway, put it in a container and they could care less where it goes. As long as it's not there and my can got emptied, I'm a happy camper. So I think that you know, from an education program and really getting out there so people realize you know, the amount of resources that are just being thrown away and not taking advantage of would probably be one of the keys that I would focus in on. Thank you. Hans? Well, I, I, I guess for... Uh, let's try that again. I, 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 would, I would echo uh, 
uh, to begin with, anyway, uh, David's comments about education, I think it is so important that, uh, that we let people know, um, you know, what, what the state of our, our, our industry is and what the, um, you know, what the, the level of, of waste that we have that's, um, you know, that's being just, you know, discarded and, and, and not used. We, we actually go and, and um, one of my, um, my managers at, at one of my sites, the one at I-95, he's, he's actually made a few presentations on just that. And he goes, and he goes out and he talks to mostly students. And, and his first question is, you know, pretty basic and simple, but what do you know about trash? I mean, are you at all familiar with or understand kind of what's going on once you put it out at the curb? And what's out at the curb, and they're not. I mean, it's it's just amazing how much information is is not being shared, and I think I think that's that's just extremely important. I th I think the other part of that, if if you know, if I had the wand, um, the 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 facilities that, and we're trying to do this at 66. At least that's the plan anyway. But the the, the facilities that we have for accepting material, they need to be um, um, much more um, uh, comprehensive in terms of what they take and, and how we sort and, and handle materials. We, we, we tend to just put everything together and, and, and push it on out. Um, so I, I think if, if uh, we made a, uh, a, a much better effort to to sort that material, not only with at generation, but at, at certain facilities, I think um, I think those rates would would begin to skyrocket, and they'd get to the levels that uh, you know that that we would like to see. I I agree with everything that's been said. Um, the education piece is important because um, uh, between 25 and 30 percent of what we're still getting at the landfill is recyclable, and we're the top recycling county, so there's an education and participation gap among the public. Um, but what I would do if I were the uh, benevolent, I almost said dictator, leader, leader benevolent leader, um, I'd like to think I'm a benevolent leader anyway, <laughs> but uh, is uh, more partnerships with the private sector. So a lot of this material has value, the, the compost program. Uh, that was on the screen earlier uh, is value. It makes money. There's a market. Uh, we have a processor, and you know we're able to get the product to market, and people buy it. There's a, still a lot of material that's going in. There's furniture that people get tired of. They put at the curb that goes to the landfill or goes to the incinerator. Um, there's textiles. Um, some of them can be used for clothing, but they can also be used for um, insulation. They can be used for rags. They can be used for other material. Um, appliances, electronics. There's a lot of things in our waste stream that people are just disposing of. But w with the right, I think, private partnerships, um, we're able to get some of that innovation about, you know, how do we capture this material? How do we turn it into value? Because we know it inherently has value. Um, you know, and, and, and also, you know, how, how, how do we work together, um, you know, to, to create jobs? So, like, the great thing about recycling and the reuse and the circular economy is that they're jobs. A lot of the jobs are here because they're things that are here in our county or our city or our municipality that have to get pulled out, picked apart, you know, and repackaged. So that's jobs right in our community. So um, partnerships with the private sector. Chris? Uh, Thank you for handing me the scepter, Supreme Leader of the Planet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna think a little bit bigger. I agree with everything that was said here, but if I, I'm gonna put myself in the White House, Piat 2020. Um, <laughs> uh, I think that I would, I would have some sort of a, an enormous um, Manhattan Project style effort to uh, figure out how to extract as much energy out of our, our domestic sources as possible, wean ourselves off of foreign energy. There's so much energy in what we throw away and ends up in the landfill. I showed you very briefly the sewer heat recovery um, project that we have. We've got two of them that are going in in DC, one at our headquarters and one at a building in DuPont Circle. Uh, we've calculated, it's low grade heat, but we've calculated for DC, which is a medium sized city, 600,000 people, there's 200 megawatts of equivalent power there in the sewers. We're not gonna be able to extract it all, but 
holy shit, we should be able to get some of them. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just, it's flowing underneath every city in the nation. Uh, and was that a technical term? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I just, so yeah. yeah. So I, we, uh, we came up with the, with the name for our, our product, Bloom. It's nice and it's flowery and it's beautiful. Um, we had a whole list of really horrible ideas that the board didn't like. My, my favorite of which was DC's feces. Uh, but anyways, I would, I would, if I get voted in, that's what I'm gonna do, so. Fascinating, fascinating. This is, um, We've come to the part of the program where this is your opportunity to ask a, a question of our uh, esteemed panelists. Let me first by saying thank you. So there's microphones in each corner and there you go. So please come on up and get to a, get to a mic so your question can be heard. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Thank you so much for this very informative and inspiring panel. My question goes to the individual behavior side of things. Um, I very much believe in the value of incentives, and um, I think about what practices can we put in place on a very local level that encourages the right kind of behavior. So two very quick snippets about that. Um, my parents' community in upstate New York a long time ago, I was very surprised and intrigued to learn about that they charged every resident for every bag of garbage they picked up. So there was a fee attached, and that was something that my father very much <laughs> paid attention to, incentivizing people to, to maybe think a little bit more about that garbage bag. Um, on the second side of it, in my community in Arlington, which is a condo association, um, there is a challenge with recycling electronic waste, which has come up in this discussion. And so for someone to take that big TV over to their recovery facility, there's a fee attached with that. Well, who wants to lug a large 50 pound or what, however heavy piece of equipment over to that facility? There's time involved, what have you. It's easier to put it out on the curb, right? and shift that responsibility to someone else. So what examples or what approaches are you all using in your work that can incentivize a little bit more conscious behavior choice on the part of, of individuals in the community? Thank you. Hans, and I guess Adam. Yeah, I, I would, um, I mean, but what comes to mind, and, and I think from a big picture perspective, it's create value and show value. You know, it's, it, to me, it's similar to the, you know, kind of a change model when, you know, we, we have people go through that all the time. It's, you know, what are you trying to do? What do I have to do? And what's in it for me? I think, I think we need to show that value. There's, there's, and that, that kind of goes back to the education. I think people want to do the right thing, but sometimes they need a little bit of a nudge and they need to see that there's real value in that and that we will, um, particularly if it's a business community, Here's why doing this makes sense. And I think we can do the same thing for the residents. Um, the, the, the partnerships that Adam mentioned, they make sense. I mean, you're talking about the TVs, the electronic waste. Our e-waste volumes keep going up and up. Uh, we thought all those old you know, tube TVs where you gotta turn them to change the channel, I thought those would be gone by now. They keep coming. Um, and, <laughs> And we also provide that service free of charge through, through, um, through the county collection operation. Um, not, not all the service providers do that, but um, that's something that we feel is important. And again, we think there's value in that. Um, that's reflected in, in, a, in a cost structure and a rate that they're charged, but we, we, we communicate that value. They recognize that value and and, and we're able to get the vast majority, I think, because, I mean, I see a lot of that material dumped and we don't get a lot of e-waste in our, at least TVs, if you will, in our, in our MSW. Adam? Really, really good question. Um, I, I think um, it's a combination of carrots and sticks. So the incentives that you mentioned, um, that there's some value, what you mentioned is called pay as you throw, where people are, have to pay exactly for what they put out. Um, 
sizing uh, trash receptacles small and recycling big is a way to uh, implicitly do that. Um, and then uh, sticks. So I, you know, we if uh, if recycling is set at the curb, but it has trash in it, um, we don't pick it up because it's contaminated. But what if we did the opposite? That if there's recycling in the trash, it's not picked up because that's a burden on the county that the taxpayers are subsidized. You know. Um, also, uh, uh, so we, we, we focus a lot on public behavior because there is a gap in public participation that we have to close. But I believe in shared responsibility. So we need carrots and sticks also for government. So our government's doing everything that they need to do. Are our, our operations efficient in our waste stream? Are there laws that the, the county and city councils are passing that's requiring us uh, to be good stewards to make sure that we're not um, doing that and that we're investing in resource recovery um, infrastructure. So there's a lot of discussion in the district here, great discussion about citing their own organics composting facility because they know that so that's uh, something that, you know, public leaders also have to invest in. And then the private sector. So some of these products um, are nuisances. Some of these products are costly. Some of them are burdensome that we as taxpayers are subsidizing and paying for these persistent materials that are not provided. So what, what responsibilities do the, does the private sector have? So you know, some examples of that is that they invest or help fund you know, recovery operations, and there's some examples for different products that, uh, that do that, um, uh, or they help pay for infrastructure, um, or that they're you know, uh, bottle redemption fees and, and fees on the production of material you know, those are ways to do it too. But um, I like the Manhattan Project metaphor. You know, I think that this is a time where we need to have fresh thinking and your question is a perfect one. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, my name is Helen. I'm from the city of Alexandria's resource recovery team. So hello to my colleagues over there on stage. Um, I have a question on food waste. So for city of Alexandria, we do collect some of our food waste from farmers markets, send it to PG County. Thank you for the expansion this past year or this year. Um, but my question that we often get from residents, um, Direct uh, Director Piot, I have a question for you. The residents ask if you are faced with the choice and you can't compost and you are limited to um, composting, uh, is it better than to put it in your sink, in your kitchen, than to put it in your trash bin? Excellent question, comes up a lot. Um, I would say yes. I'd rather have it come down the sink and to the treatment plant than go to the landfill because then we're at least making use of it. I'd rather it came to the wastewater treatment plant and got put directly into the digester because then we avoid the energy and the chemicals necessary to take out the nutrients and the carbon and everything. But I'd much rather have it come down through the sewer system and to the plant than end up in the landfill. Uh, just or just Let me think on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess it depends on how dry the food waste is and whether or not it's actually generating electricity. Because at waste energy facilities, you got to expend a lot of energy to drive that water off before you get any energy. I'd have to do some calculations. Okay, thank, you. thank you for your question. Yes, sir. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Carlo Laporta uh, from Capital Sun Group. And... Uh, just for reference, this group of people right here from Eco City Farms, they're in the process of solarizing their operations. And that's the question I would like to ask for, to you, the panel. Are you using solar technologies, photovoltaics, somebody is, and also solar thermal in your processing of the waste that you handle? Great. David, we'll start with you because I know we just had a discussion out in the hall about California. Right. So definitely one of the things that we're looking at is from a green energy standpoint is, is as we're processing material, we're going to use electricity. So what are the options that we can, that we can take there? I mean, we can uh, co-locate at waste to energy facilities, but solar is definitely one of the areas that we've been looking at to power our operations because we see that as a very, very low carbon footprint. Uh, and that's a tremendous benefit. So definitely that is an area that we're uh, looking into currently. Hans? I'll go right across the panel. Thank you. Um, we, have, um, we have not gotten into that um, to any great degree and, and 
I'm, I'm sure there's probably people in this audience probably speak to that a little better than, than myself about some of the issues with the, um, you know, the net metering and the whole Dominion Power thing. But um, we, we do have a plan. Um, Fairfax County has, has an environmental vision uh, to reduce greenhouse gases and reduce our, our, uh, our use of, uh, of fossil fuels. And we do have some projects that are now, um, that are now being funded. It's, it's actually part of a current initiative. And I know because there's two of them, I think, that we are pushing on the Department of Public Works side and solid waste side, one of which is at our I-66 site. We're gonna put an array on top of our, uh, our transfer station. All the cranes that we operate inside that building are all electric. And, and we think we can offset a tremendous amount of uh, power requirements from Dominion by, by putting that up there. But um, some, of those, some of those regulations and laws, at least I think, are being uh, looked at. And, and hopefully down the road, they'll be um, um, much more advantageous for, for folks like ourselves that want to that get more deeply involved in the, in the solar projects. Thank you, Hans. Adam, then Chris. We're moving in that direction. We, uh, our, our county um, central administration building just moved to a new building that has a solar array over the parking lot. Um, and we have, I don't know how many, I think dozens of megawatts uh, planned for the next 15 years coming into the county for that purpose. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna let Chris answer the question okay. and then I gotta go to the other gentleman yeah, in the interest sure. of time. Thank okay, you. Well, I had one, one additional thing. I'm, I'm a solar dinosaur. I started working in this field in the 1970s. So I've seen a lot. Um, we have put cogeneration systems on houses now. So we're making PV electricity, but we're pulling the heat off the PV panels and sending it to water source heat pumps. So we're providing all the energy that these houses need. So there are options and ideas that are starting to spill out along these lines that can really make what you're doing much more efficient. Thank you for your coming. Chris, I know you said you were about to invest. Yes. Yes, we are. <laughs> oh, wait, but it's, we're, we take advantage of the incredibly strong uh, SREC market in DC. Yes. You go across the river to Virginia and it makes less sense. So. Uh, as a solar customer, they're, they're valueless. They're truly valueless. Yes, sir, last question and then we, then we have, oh, I've been given five more minutes. So, yes, sir. Yeah, um, my name is Scott Emery. I'm with Bauman Consulting, and my question is about the digester technology. Uh, super quick, I spent some time in Germany in the past and looked at uh, communities that had very little waste because of their biogester, biodigester implementation. And um, we looked at the business case; it wasn't so strong, say, 10 years ago. My my question is: is what do you see for the future of that technology, and what are the barriers that need to be overcome to see that expand more here? We'll we'll start with Chris, then Dave. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense for us as a municipality because we have the solids that we need to digest or do something with anyways. And in the 60s and 70s, digesters were built solely on the economics of volume reduction because we had to take that stuff someplace and truck it. And now we have the option of making green energy and selling the tier one renewable energy credits. So it makes great sense for my industry. I think it's a harder business case if you don't have the wastewater coming in, but I'll maybe leave that to you to answer. So from a biodigester, that's one of the, the, the pieces that we see is, is, is part of the puzzle. And we actually are very, very interested in the biogas that is coming off on that, either producing electricity or actually taking the biogas and using that into our process to improve the overall yield of producing the uh, liquid chemicals on the back end. So we, we definitely are constantly looking as to how we can uh, co-locate uh, with such an operation. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name's Nancy Najeri, and I'm a consultant in the energy efficiency and renewable energy field, and I'm a citizen of Fairfax County, and I fully agree with the education aspect of it, because I think it's going to come from we citizens, but I have a question. I have three very quick examples, and how would you folks, working on the more uh, top part of the uh, equation, help the rest of us to force this forward? I've been in a coffee shop very you know, progressive coffee shop in Falls Church City couldn't easily see the recycling bins. The man, per, whoever puts them around only showed the garbage. I was in Orlando 
airport recently, same thing, couldn't identify easily the recycling. And um, I have one other <coughs> example, but quickly, how can we, oh, Fairfax County, a high school that finally got their recycling bins in there, they're totally overflowing. So by the time you have an afternoon event with uh, like a football you know, dinner, there's no place to put the recycling. So how can we as citizens and also those of us who work in the field prompt the higher ups in different areas, managerial, et cetera, to maybe change the signage, change the type of you know baskets there are, make sure workers know to put them forefront so we as citizens can use them. Education, we'll start with Adam, then Hans, and... Yeah, thank you. Uh, so there's policy solutions to everything that you mentioned, and um, our county recently passed a law, and it's uh, similar to laws in European nations that require all um, commercial establishments to provide um, uh, recycling, to have a, a recycling hauling contract, um, and that, um, and there's regulations around the recycling receptacles. So um, maybe it's a bank or a restaurant that they have to have a visible and accessible recycling um, receptacle right next to a trash receptacle. So you know that's an important piece because if people have one, they'll just put it in. Um, we've also required all multifamily uh, and apartment buildings to have recycling. We have inspectors that go around and, um, and inspect to make sure that, it, um, that businesses are compliant. Also required all public events. So um, the team soon to be formerly known as the Redskins are required <laughs> to um, have recycling um, and, and have a contract at, at all their facilities as well as like the local baseball game uh, for uh, the Boys and Girls Club. Hans? I think you get out and, and, and just kind of spread that message. I know, uh, I know we've heard it on the, on the public works and the solid waste side. Um, we, we don't do all of that. For example, the schools, we're not involved with the schools. It's separate, um, but, but we're, we're constantly uh, available and, and offering to help, um, getting involved with the, um, their programs, helping them either either develop a, uh, a new approach and or a new policy to, to, uh, to push the recycling. It's, um, it, it's something I don't know that we've done the best job at um, in the past, but I can tell you it's, it's coming more and more to the forefront and particularly with the, the China sword and, and that whole thing. And maybe that, you know, it's, it's a bad excuse that that's kind of what nudged a lot of things forward, but it has. And so may, maybe, maybe a lot will come of that that's, that's positive. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hi. Um, can you hear? My name is Daniela, and I've been a consultant devoted to the circular economy for 10 years and a passionate researcher for 15. And there are two things that I really haven't seen mentioned here today. And one is the IPCC report and the, the game it plays, the circular economy, on making sure that we, you know, survive on time. You know, yeah. they make it pretty drastic in the last 11 years. And the other thing is the regional efforts that I hope that this event and other things that you're already doing triggers for the future. So my question is, what are we going to have after this next? Are you um, b meeting with the economic development people of your region to make a stronger regional economy? And I'll just um, make another effort on that. DC is doing some great efforts when the DC is the sustainability plan that only mentioned that we need a zero waste master plan to reach a 80% diversion waste by 2032. To reach 80% diversion waste by 2032, we are already late. That, that master plan should have been built three years ago. And I know there are the best intentions, but what I'm trying to convey here is the urgency of the matter. I don't see zero waste master plans being conveyed and and working in collaboration in the region. I don't see heavy investments on industry that is able to process all this plastic, but most importantly, I don't see the shift and the leap that we need to take to change this economy of producing more and more and more, and the type of, 
Another thing not mentioned except for this gentleman today, their shared responsibility of shifting from a consum consumption, consumption and plastics to breaking free from plastic and building an economy where all the, if you all have it like your golden ticket today, that all the products and the, the packaging will be immediately turned into the compost. So are we gonna talk seriously about the circular economy here and what are you gonna do next? Thank you. I think, Dave, that there's, there's an opportunity for technology in what Enerchem is doing to, to bring that around to an end product that is useful. So perhaps you'd like to talk a bit, little bit about it. And, you know, addressing your, your, your points there is obviously we see what, what we're doing is really taking, you know, a waste stream that's being generated. And yes, I, I agree 100%. We don't see any reduction in, in the waste stream. We just see it uh, continually growing. Uh, but at the same time, we're taking those products and really putting them back into a product. But I think in, in looking at your circular economy and discussing it versus Europe is much more far advanced than we are in North America. But you're starting to see more and more clusters of uh, groups of counties and cities that are starting to take it seriously and taking a, a, you know, a, a snail's approach, for lack of a better term putting tremendous goals out there that are going to be very difficult to achieve. And yes, there's a lot of cities that are late in, in counties in doing this, but I think you're starting to see that, you know, it is actually moving forward and people are recognizing it. So to me, that's really the first step in, in, in getting the, the programs off the ground. Chris, Adam, and Hans, and then we have to stop for a break, but these gentlemen will be available in, in the hall afterwards. Chris? No, we're, I'm, that's, we're, we're at the end, I'm told, and uh, we're the guests of our friends here in Canada, and can, can, Canadian rules apply. Chris? Hello. I'll let these three gentlemen answer, and, and then we're going to take a break. Well, in the interest of time, I'm just going to agree with everything you said. We need better ways to communicate and work I'm working very closely with the Department of Public Works in DC to help them meet their 80% goal. They have no idea how they're going to meet it. <laughs> it's, it's great to have the goal, but um, it's, it's really, it's, it's an incredibly aggressive goal. And I think that we can be part of the solution. I just got to convince my board to build a receiving station and the, the business case makes sense. It's, got, it, it's, it's terrible, but it comes down to dollars. So we just need to find better ways to um, convey the urgency. Adam and Hans, briefly. I agree with everything you said. The sense of urgency is not trickling up to um, policymakers as, as much as it should be. That's why I feel it's incumbent on progressive jurisdictions, and this is a progressive region, that we go out there and show that it can be done. So um, uh, I think that, um, you know, into the, the question earlier, you know, it's lobbying. It's, you know, know who is um, the champion on the city council or the mayor that's going to do stuff, who are the groups that they're going to listen to, and to organize and get those laws passed, because it's not rocket science. It can be done. Super. Hans? Yeah, I would. I, ditto, but um, I, I guess the one thing that I would add is having, having started in the industry in the early 80s, so it's been a long time, there's been a whole lot of progress. It's not enough. We're still heading in the right direction. It's not fast enough, but, but we recognize it and, and we're going there. Um, and I think with the help of you, know, you folks and, and, and what you know, these communities are doing and companies, um, hopefully we'll, we'll speed that up a little bit. Thank you. And just, uh, just a brief commercial, uh, Northern Virginia Regional Commission serves as a solid waste management board uh, for our localities and we're clearing house for information and data. And um, Debbie Speliotopoulos from our office is here. So if you have any questions, suggestions, ideas that we can share with our local governments, we would be happy to do so. Thank you to our panelists. And it's, it's time for a, a, a coffee break. Thank we'll, you. We'll take a 10-minute break, but please bring your cards to win the maple syrup. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs>